God said, still on day number one, let there be light. And there was light. Astrophysicists are currently admitting that all the physical phenomena of the universe conceivably could have come from the radiant energy of light alone. All the future atoms, all the future molecules, all of the stellar heavens, all of the living systems, according to current scientific physical investigation, are a product of light. Now, we would certainly disagree with the timeline and the mechanism by which light was expressed in material molecules and living systems. We would certainly disagree as to timeline and mechanism. We have a clear concept of biblical and scientific proportions. But other than the time involved and the mechanism, the concept is consistent. That light, with its myriad forms of radiation, has the potential to express what we find physically demonstrated in the universe. And God said, let there be light. Recently, at UCLA, an experiment was run. Until the last few months, physicists have actually scoffed at a concept that if you have a body of water, if you express a dimension of sound, you can then produce light. That was scoffed at until recently. Seth Petterman, PhD at UCLA, ran an experiment. He simply used acoustical properties, just a sound system, incremented acoustical properties. He took a flask of water, just standard pure water, and using a small speaker system, he bombarded that flask of water with sonar energy, with sound. And to his amazement, he and his colleagues, along with the students, found that the percussive waves of sound generated inside that water a bubble. That bubble would shrink and expand in relation to the increments of the sound and actually emitted full spectral light. Thus, in the laboratory, it has been demonstrated that if you have a body of water, and near that body of water, you express incremented sound, thus you have light expressed. That's exactly what the creation model has stated from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. That is totally consistent with modern scientific research. Thus, we have the end of day number one. Oh, what a promising day it's been. Surely, the God of this universe, identified singularly as a God who has volition and choice, a system of righteousness, consciousness, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence would not stop here with an embryonic creation, but would materialize his full purposes, and he did. Let's follow day number two. Day number one, God expressed himself in a space-time dimension, created space itself, and remember, the space that he originally created was not as large as we now observe it to be. We know that from a number of scriptures. In the 104th Psalm, the scriptures state that God stretched out the heavens. That involves the space-time dimension. Time and space are interrelated. And all that God would place in stellar bodies would be stretched out. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, it states that thus the heavens and the earth were finished. So it appears that throughout day number six of creation, throughout the first week of creation, literal solar days, a literal week of creative divine activity, it appears 
that God continued to stretch out the space-time dimension and the stellar bodies that he would create on day number four until he had exactly the right distance for a perfectly, divinely orchestrated symphony. But the earth in this space-time dimension would remain at or near the center of the creation. And this earth in time would be stretched only marginally. Thus you have a literal six days of creation transpiring, six solar days. Yet, D. Russell Humphreys, Ph.D. of Sandia National Laboratory, has done a tremendous work taking the equations of Einstein, pre-Einstein and post-Einsteinian mathematicians and physicists, theorists, and in examining those equations, he has found that as you stretch time and space, you dilate time. Now remember, space is not continuing to be stretched, as current cosmologists suggest. It was finished in the stretching exercise at the end of the first week of creation. But at that time, while six literal days were transpiring on planet Earth, the stretching and maturing of the heavens in perfect symmetry and perfect design without any flaws would mean that if we were to travel into space to the most distant of the stars, it possibly would take us billions of years to get there, even traveling at the speed of light. Thus, Dr. Humphreys has gone to great lengths in reconciling time dilation. He also points out, as we will observe in uh, a short while, that God again, at the experience of the flood, stretched out space and time. So thus we have an exercise of divine proportions throughout the entire universe. But let's call your attention to planet Earth, day number two. Genesis chapter one and verse number six states that on day number two, God said, let there be a firmament. And God separated the waters above the firmament from the waters below the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven in the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, anything above the surface of the earth is in the direction of heaven. It's absolutely clear that there was a particular dimension of this firmament called in the Hebrew rakia. Let's examine this firmament. Remember on day number one, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And on day number one, in so doing, you would have generated an electromagnetic field. You would have generated charged water, free charged hydrogen and oxygen available in these lines of electromagnetic energy. Let me emphasize the importance of that field of electromagnetic energy. Russian scholar Dubrov and American scholar R. O. Becker spent decades analyzing data and running experiments and have found that all biological systems are dependent upon the Earth's magnetic field for cellular communication. Did you get that, class? All biological systems, including the insects, the butterflies, the arachnids, the reptiles, the dinosaurs, the great cats, the avian creatures, the birds, man himself in cellular communication are all dependent on the Earth's electromagnetic field. The Earth's electromagnetic field provides an entity, a flow field. The internal structure of the cell and the very molecules themselves and the subatomic particles respond to that flow of energy and are dependent upon that field of energy. Thus, the work of the Spirit of God on day number one was necessary for living systems that would be created in the future, in the week of creation. But now, envisioning those, intending those with his own purpose, the Creator designed on day number two a very special habitat that would be optimal for generating the perfect environment. We call that the pre- flood world. Let's examine the details. 
The word for that firmament above the earth, imagine a bubble of water. Above that, you have various bodies of water, increments of water. Throughout the universe, on planet earth, you would have waters on the surface and waters inside the surface of the earth. But suspended above the earth, approximately 10 miles, we know it would be approximately 10 miles because given a specific diameter of the earth and given the optimal electromagnetic field, given the fact that it was charged appropriately, its lines of energy would be pinched and concentrated. Thus, the optimal area would be approximately 10 miles above the pre-flood globe. So in that area, imagine a very thin bubble of water. But now this bubble of water had very special dimensions. The word in the Hebrew is designated rakia. God said, let there be a rakia. We really didn't know what to do with that word. Let there be a rakia. The word rakia means to compress, pound together, and stretch out the ark of heaven in thin metal sheets. Class, did you get that? To compress, pound together, and stretch out the ark of heaven in thin metal sheets. There was nothing but water available. How could there be metal sheets? Are we suggesting that God built a metal dome above the earth in this original creation and symphony design? Not at all. We didn't know what to do with that until at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, later verified in other labs internationally, they took the elements of water, compressed them under super cold conditions, added energy. The oxygen of water simply turned blue. But when they took the hydrogen of water, or hydrogen separately, compressed it under super cold conditions, that hydrogen, which is at the top of the Mendelevian chart of metals, that hydrogen bonded into a crystalline lattice, took upon itself actual crystalline form, and became transparent to rays of light. As they compressed it more, in one trillionth of a cubic inch diameter, in capsulization, as they compressed it more, most of the material, most of that metallic material, hydrogen under those conditions, took upon itself the form of a metal, crystalline in form. That metallic crystalline hydrogen in the laboratory remained, for the better part, for the larger part, transparent, at least translucent to light. But in very tiny grains, it became opaque and became superconductive. You will see, adjacent to this explanation, an actual laboratory experiment where we took some materials, took an element with a magnetic field, electromagnetic field simulated, put a superconductive material above that element, and it actually rides in the lines of electromagnetic energy. That's what superconductivity does. Therefore, on day number two of creation, when God took the elements he had used, uh, had created on day number one, and the elements separated by the Spirit of God into this electromagnetic field above the earth, when that was done, then when God added energy, it appears that the hydrogen bonded into a crystalline lattice, took upon itself a metallic form, first became transparent, and then as pressures were added further, molecular and atomic crowding occurred, and in tiny grains, you will actually experience superconductive opaque material. Thus, it would ride in suspension above the earth. Now, it has been found in laboratory experiments that if you add a little disturbance to that superconductive granular material, that is, if you were to add some more compressed water molecules and disturb the chain, 
it super levitates. That is, not only does it ride above the magnetic field, but it actually rides in suspension below the magnetic field as well and keeps itself in a symmetrical, pinned area of the flux lines. Therefore, scientifically in the laboratory, we have verified the plausibility of the creation model for generating approximately 10 miles above the Earth a superconductive, transparent, crystalline form with grains of material being opaque and maintaining it. Now, you'll find in the inset a visualization showing that the light going directly through such a material would be trapped in shortwave radiation in the opaque material. But the transparent and translucent material would actually transfer the mid-spectral and long wave radiation of light and actually photomultiply that light and enhance it. Thus, on day number four of creation, which we will address in the near future in this creation and symphony model dissertation, on day number four, we'll see how God could set the stars in that firmament. By setting the stars in the firmament, we're not suggesting that God place the stars in the firmament. The word set in the Hebrew is Nathan. It means to add and to yield. Thus, we find the energy of star and stellar radiation in cosmic bodies, some of that being invisible energy, in the mid-spectral line would actually be enhanced, Nathanized, so that we could get the full benefit on planet Earth from tiny, weak signals coming from distant space by God's design. I'm simply saying that the creation model makes sense. I'm saying that you have water composing the elements of that firmament, and specifically hydrogen being the central element. The entire firmament was probably only a few inches thick. Many have envisioned it being hundreds of feet thick or miles thick. Not so. Only a few inches thick because we have calculations indicating the amount of water that would be precipitated later. We have calculations involving the characteristics, the physical characteristics, so that the following would occur. The mid-spectral and long wave radiation would transfer right through the firmament, actually be enhanced in the firmament. But the short wave radiation designed into God's original creation would be assimilated into the opaque material and reassimilated back into the energy field of the firmament itself. Thus we find orchestrated a beautiful design as living systems would be created for planet Earth that would need the electromagnetic field and would use the energy of the electromagnetic field. That field was gently and slowly resupplied by the energy of the stellar bodies. Class, I want to emphasize that this model is tentative and preliminary. I was not there. My colleagues who have assisted in much of this research were not there. We have the biblical record, an academic observation of the cosmic record. That cosmic record is distorted. In general, it's reliable, but it has been contaminated. Even the heavens are not pure in God's sight after disturbance occurred. We will examine that disturbance in the near future. Thus, we find that we can examine the pure record, the scriptures. We can examine a slightly distorted, unreliable record, but still beatific in its design, the cosmic record. But what we observe and postulate is tentative. One day, when we know as we are known, we'll be able to look back and see if all our conclusions were justified academically and precisely. But as we follow in the creation model, we do have justification for assurance that we're on the right track. I want to emphasize that on day number two, we've now had a structure put in place. Not only do we have vibratory energy in the form of light and atomic energy in the form of atoms and molecular energy in the form of water, but we now have a structure above a structure. We have a crystalline structure. So we actually have a form coming into place with an interplay of creation 
in symphony. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. In Discover Magazine, recently it was published that the vacuum of space influences the atoms. We're not just talking about independent entities. Everything about the creation is a part of everything else about the creation. The world, Discover Magazine went on to say, the world is at its most basic level a connected unit and creation and symphony recognizes that, appreciates that, and is built upon that concept. This magazine further went on to say that stars and atoms and the vacuum all are part of a single seamless whole. Now watch this class. It will not be until day number four that God coalesces some of the energy of the light that he created on day number one into stellar bodies and galaxies. But even in the preparation, the physical dimensions of the earth in its nebular form on day number two is still a part of the orchestration of the entire design. Scientific American related that the neutron inside the atom in the nucleus, the neutron of the atom can sense an electron from a distance without experiencing a force generated by the particles, electric or magnetic field, a pure potential field. Now that's extremely important. That means that not only the space between the surface of this watery sphere and the crystalline firmament plays a part, not only does the space itself play a part, not only does the vibratory oscillation of light itself play a part, but inside the very structure of the atom there is a sensing mechanism related to the entire seamless whole. What a wonderful creation. Now, we have shown here in our model that some of the vibratory energy, particularly radio waves, are picked up, enhanced, and distributed down to the surface of this vibrating internal body of water. And that is consistent with scientific analysis. What we're saying is that all of the energy of the light, all of the energy of the atoms involved in the water, all of the molecules of the water, all of the crystalline firmament play a part in picking up and receiving these celestial tones. Later we're going to see that the very constellations themselves and the planets themselves play a part in giving us a sense of music around us. Don DeYoung related that the idea of celestial tones, particularly speaking of God's future work, but inherent embryonically in this original work on days number one and two of creation. The idea of celestial tones has a valid basis. Since musical notes are always produced by repeated, regular vibrations, whether originating from vibrating strings, reeds, or drum membranes, as the planets, later to be created on day number four, circle the sun, the motion of each one is a unique form of slow, regular vibration. Thus, class, we have a lot to anticipate in the future. But now, to the current on day number two. Science Magazine relates that all of the masses, charges, and other properties of subatomic particles arise from vibrations at different frequencies a uniform chorus of violins playing a symphony of different notes. It's no wonder then that in order to express this model, I couldn't arrive at any other conclusion than this is the creation and symphony model. Not only are we going to see that living forms are a part of the symmetry and symphony of the creation, but built into the very fabric of the creation, Interrelated between space, time, and matter, you have vibratory oscillations. You have music at the very base of all. Sky and Telescope magazine related that as if by a chain, our planet's surface is connected intimately to the space environment. It is all one seamless, complete whole of design. Now, in our studies, let's go beyond day number two. God said, let the dry land appear, and the dry land appeared on day number three of creation. 
Is that scientific? Let's examine the granite itself. You'll see an inset with a little piece of granite being shown. That granite has a distribution of various crystalline elements and radioisotopes. According to the theory of evolution, that granite, which is the basement crustal rock of the earth, took 300 million years to crystallize, according to the theory of evolution. But the manual, the scripture, the biblical record states that on day number three, God said, let the dry land appear, and the dry land appeared. Dr. Robert Gentry, world-class researcher and scholar, found that as you examine the granite at all levels worldwide, you find a very unique characteristic. Inside the crystalline biotite or mica of the granite, you find tiny little rings left from the radioactive decay field, energy rings from radioactive decay of radiogenic materials and elements. Among those, you'll find the rings of polonium, polonium-218, polonium-214, and polonium-210. Now, class, remember that in radioactive materials, when you've expended seven half-lives, all of that material is gone. Now, in order to have the rings left by the decay of polonium-210, whose half-life is about 22 days, that means that the outside of the creation time potential would be a matter of weeks at best, but it's better still. Dr. Gentry found rings left by the radioactive decay of polonium-218. The half-life of polonium-218 is less than three minutes. That means that to record that polonium-218 had been there in the crystalline granite, all of the body of crystalline granite had to be functional and recording in less than 20 minutes because in that time, all seven half-lives would have been expended. But it's better still. The manual, the biblical records state, God said, let the dry land appear, and the dry land appeared. Dr. Gentry found the pleochroic halos, little radio halos of polonium-214. The half-life of polonium-214 is 0.000, .000 one six four seconds. That means that in less than two one thousandth of a second, faster than we can snap our finger, all of the polonium-214 would be dissipated. That means for the granite to have recorded that the polonium-214 was there at all, it had to be created faster than we can snap our fingers. The manual is correct. Creation in its increments had to be instantaneous. Watch this. On day number three, the dry land appeared. What do we find in the dry land? We find the signal, the signature, in the granite. But as we look further beneath that, we find great reservoirs of water, even today. Below that, you find great pockets of asphalt, hydrocarbons. Below that, you find radioactive materials. And as been observed by geophysicists that at regular intervals, incremented intervals inside the earth, you have a barrier of radioactive materials or a band of radioactive materials, then a barrier of moderating, insulating materials, all the way down to the core itself. Now the core is extremely important. All of this is extremely important. Are you getting the idea that in creation and symphony, on day number three of creation, when God said, let the dry land appear, all of the dry land of planet Earth appeared as an orchestrated unit with a central iron-nickel core whose primary function would be to keep the magnetic field appropriately oriented.